So today is the first speaker, Caroline from Ohio State University. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation uh, to come here. I feel like I'm very loud, but I guess it's okay. Um, right. So I'll start with uh, some motivation background. Um, so this is Samaretti's regularity lemma, which I think a lot of us are familiar with, but it says that for all epsilon greater than zero, there's some bound M depending on epsilon, so that any sufficiently large graph, um, you can partition its vertex set into at most M parts, um, so that almost so that all the parts have roughly almost the same size, and so that almost all the pairs are what's called epsilon regular. So it's a little bit beside the point what exactly epsilon regular means here. Although I think, I guess in this audience, um, likely most of you know what this means, but it mean, if you don't, it just means like, roughly speaking, it looks kind of like a random graph. So yeah, I, I, get, I often give this talk to logicians, so I have to like, introduction. Um, okay, so this is a, a really useful theorem and, and has many applications and something that's important to, you know, the context in which this theorem can be applied is, like how, how this M depends on the epsilon. So, um, so of course, one wants to know like what is, what is the form of this bound? And the proof, the proof gives like a tower type bound. And of course, Gowers showed that, that it must be a tower type bound. So there are graphs for which the smallest epsilon regular partitions have to have at least this many parts, some tower and epsilon inverse. Um, right, and of course, the TWX for this talk will mean like a tower of twos of height x. Um, right, and then, okay, uh, a more optimal bond bound was uh, obtained by Conlon and Fox. So, so the bound is, is very large, I guess, depending on your perspective. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so I wanna talk about, um, Sort of, so the, the idea is, I guess, the, the bound cannot be improved in general, like for general graphs. So then kind of a shift, a shift in the question would be, well, under what circumstances can you improve the bound? Okay. When, when, when can you obtain kind of more robust structure results? So given a graph G, I'll let like curly F sub G be the set system on the vertex set consisting of the sets of neighborhoods of points. Sorry, this should say V. Sets of neighborhoods where V ranges over the vertex. Okay, and this just, N of V is just a, the neighborhood of the vertex. So this is, so it's a collection of subsets of the vertex set obtained by taking the, the neighbors of every vertex in the graph. So this is a, you know, a reasonable set system. And we say that the VC dimension of G is the VC dimension of this set system. If you don't know what VC dimension is, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it means in this context. The graph G has VC dimension at least K if there are vert vertices A1 through AK. And maybe I'll draw. Okay, and for every subset, okay, so I have these vertices A1 through AK. And then for every subset of the of one through K, you have another vertex. B sub S who connects to exactly the points in S and to none of the points outside of S. So it's essentially saying that you can encode the power set of the, of the set of integers from one to K. Yeah. Uh, BS is allowed to be one of the AI, right? It's any subset of one through K. No, I'm, like the, the vertex BS can be one of the uh, AI. That, that is allowed. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So, so the idea is that um, saying you have VC dimension at least K is saying that you're in, you're at least in, at least complicated in this way. You can encode this amount of like the power set graph. Okay, so the higher, the idea is that if you, if you put kind of a bound on the VC dimension, that's much smaller than the size of the graph, size of the vertex set, that's a way of saying that the graph is kind of low complexity. So it's unable to encode, it's, un, it's unable to encode power sets of large sets. Um, and I, yes, and I guess, yes, sorry. Okay, so, so this is a theorem um, 
the these are the attributions here. So, um, but the, in slightly different contexts. So, so I'm stating the theorem, and then this is the more specific information. So the theorem says that um, for any k and epsilon, there's an m, so that for all sufficiently large graphs of VC dimension at most k. So this is like saying low, to, low complexity in the sense the VC dimensions at most k. Any graph like that has an epsilon regular partition where all the regular pairs, they're not just epsilon regular, they don't just look like random graphs, they look like random graphs of density close to zero or close to one. So this saying, so saying you have density near zero or one implies your epsilon regular, or maybe, you know, it depends on what I mean by near. But um, you know, if you're within epsilon of zero or one, you're already root epsilon regular. So this is this is a stronger statement than the just plain regularity lemma. So, so for a general graph, you may have regular pairs of density like a half, a third, and that's saying those pairs look like random graphs of density, a half, a third, et cetera. And this is saying that here, if you bound this VC dimension, you can ensure that all the densities are close to zero or one. So when you take like the quotient structure arising from the regular partition, you have like, this is giving you even more information. It looks even more like the quotient structure. Um, okay, so this, um, and the most, I okay, so this is interesting, but the most interesting part is that, is what, I what I'm omitting here, which is the behavior of M in this theorem. So Alan Fisher Newman first proved this um, in, in the bipartite case, and they show that the M can be taken as um, polynomial in one over epsilon. There's, so not only do you get this zero one density behavior, but you get this drastic improvement in the bound. So in the general regularity lemma that this was a tower of twos of height, epsilon inverse, and now this is polynomial in epsilon inverse. And then Lovas and Segedi gave a proof um, or proved this for, for, all, for general graphs um, with a, a, a similar bound that's polynomial in some function of, or it's polynomial in epsilon inverse with the exponents. Okay, so um, I like to sort of combine the theorems I've showed you into a, like a dichotomy type theorem because I think it kind of this is like this is like the most the most interesting way to state this from my perspective, um, and that's in the setting of hereditary graph properties. So a hereditary graph property is a class of finite graphs. Oh, I guess I didn't, def oh, that definition's not here. All right, a hereditary graph property is a class of finite graphs closed under induced subgraphs and isomorphisms. So all of our favorite classes of graphs are, or many of them are hereditary graph properties. So things that omit, you know, triangle-free graphs, H-free graphs, class of graphs emitting an induced subgraph, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And actually every hereditary graph property is characterized by saying you omit a certain collection of induced subgraphs. All right. Um, so given a hereditary graph property H and an epsilon, I'll let M sub H of epsilon be the minimal integer so that all sufficiently large, all like, all, yeah, all sufficiently large elements in the class have an epsilon regular partition with at most this many parts. So it's measuring, it's measuring, it's like the, the, the partition size function or something associated to the class. And so the idea is that you can, you know, I'm interested in sort of results that like separate hereditary graph properties along structural lines. And you have to kind of look for parameters to measure the structure. And so these theorems that I've showed you give you, give you such, a, such a separation. So this you can now state this theorem as a dichotomy, and this is a you just amalgamate like the lower bound Gowers and the nice uh, the the nice structure theorems of uh, Alan Fisher Newman and Lovas Segedi. Yeah. No, I mean I think you can adapt the Gowers construction so that. Um, once you have um, unbounded VC dimension, you can build something like that. Because if you have unbounded VC dimension, you can construct in the property any like bipartite configuration you want. Okay, anyway, I believe, I mean, I never, I never proved this for myself. I think I read this possibly in a paper by Jacob. So, like, so, so this is something that I observed at some point. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I, I should say that this is, I guess, also this observation is due to Jacob. 
but I do think I read it in in a paper by you. So yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, this it's become very important to me. This like this phrasing of it. So so um, so thank you. I guess. <laughs> um, so right. So the as a corollary, you have for any hereditary graph property, one of the following holds. Either the VC dimension is finite, meaning there's a uniform K so that everything in the property has VC dimension at most K. And in that case, M of H, MH of epsilon is polynomial and epsilon inverse. Sorry, this should be an epsilon inverse. On the other hand, if it has infinite VC dimension, then this has to be a tower in epsilon. So the idea here is that um, you can phrase, you can phrase this as a, this is a, I would call this a dichotomy for her hereditary graph properties because on the there's a gap here. There's there's a there's a huge gap between polynomial and tower. And so especially in model theory, we're very interested in in these dichotomy type theorems where you have like really tame behavior and then substantially more un, untame behavior in the other case where there's this separation in complexity. So, so to a model, so I think for a model theorist, which is kind of the other area I'm in, this is like the, the nicest way to phrase it. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about extending this theorem to hypergraphs. And um, so it, it had already been extended to hypergraphs in a certain context. Um, so we'll define a notion of VC dimension for a K-uniform hypergraph. And so what we do is we can, we can take H, a K-uniform hypergraph, and then take the, the set system consisting of um, neighbors of k minus one points. And now this is a set system on the vertex set. And so you can ask about its VC dimension. Because, okay, right. If you take k minus one vertices and you take their set, the set of neighbors of those people, that's a set of singletons. Um, and so you can say, you can decide to call the VC dimension the VC dimension of this set system. And this definition is due to Fox Pox suit. Um, hopefully I'm stating this correctly. Uh, do I think it's in two of the uh, exponent of one of reps on linear and D? I thought it was the dual. It was linear and the dual. And that's why I plugged in two to the D instead of the dual, two to the D plus one. Okay, I'll have to double check. That. Okay, yeah. Sorry. So, no, I mean, I could, for some reason I keep misstating. This uh, but I, I, che I checked this morning and it said dual. So okay. Okay, hopefully, I, hopefully that's correct. But, um, so uh, the okay, so this theorem is box and it says for any sufficiently large k uniform hypergraph of VC dimension at most d, you can find an equipartition so that almost all of the k tuples of parts have the property that the, the density of edges in that K tuple is close to zero or close to one. So I guess like maybe we'll draw a picture in the case where K is three. What do I mean? Yeah, so like, what is the statement saying? So it's saying you can partition the vertices into pieces and let's say, let's say K is three. So I'm talking about three uniform hypergraphs. Then it's saying for almost all the ways to pick three pieces out of the partition, Almost all the edge, almost all the triples here are edges, or almost all the triples here are not edges. So that's what the theorem is saying. So it's like, like an, this is a like hypergraph analog of the 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 structure theorem for graphs of bounded VC dimension. Okay, and again, you get a really nice polynomial bound here. Um, and the density, so this density condition, so in the graphs case, if you have a pair of density near zero or one, you get that it's epsilon regular and you get that thus it's, you know, it has all these equivalent quasi random properties. Here, um, saying that you have like a triple which has density close to zero or one for like a three uniform hypergraph implies a notion of hypergraph quasi randomness, which I've seen referred to in the literature as weak regularity, but probably has other names. So there's many notions of quasi randomness for hypergraphs and this having density near zero, and one, zero or one in this sense like implies one of them, which I'll call weak regularity. Um, okay, so in a certain sense, this is like a satisfying analog of, um, of the theorem. It's interesting that actually, if you go to look for a characterization uh, in terms of hereditary properties of hypergraphs, 
the the condition is not actually this um, VC dimension. It's something slightly weaker. And so Julia and I worked that out in a in our in a very long paper. It's very similar in there. In the case of case but that's not the topic of this talk, so it's just an aside. Um, but there, there is a, there is a theorem. We do have a theorem that's an if and only if, and it the condition is slightly weaker than than this here. Are there lower bounds, the, like on the dependence on VC dimension? Oh, on the bound? Yes. Yeah, I don't know about that one. Yeah, so our sorry, our characterization is not in terms of the bound, but rather in terms of whether you can have a structure theorem with the density close to zero. But that's it. Yeah, that's an interesting question. There's a lot of like. There's just a lot of questions when you go to the hypergraph setting. <laughs> uh, so, um, okay, right. So this is so so this is right. Like I said, a satisfying kind of analog. Um, and I also wanted to mention that a couple of model theorists obtained uh, related results, kind of using infinitary methods. Um, but I think because their methods are infinitary, I, you know, they're missing some things from here, like the equipartition and the bounds. Okay, so, um, but the work I want to talk about today is the goal was to kind of look at analogs of tame regularity lemmas for like this much more complicated notion of hypergraph regularity that was developed um, in order to obtain like a, like a general counting lemma. Um, so, so, so this type of regularity was developed by a lot of people. Here's a list of people who were involved with this. Um, Frankel, Gowers, Kwiatkow, and Nagel, Rodel, Skokin, Schacht. And I hope I hope I kind of got all the main people here, but there's a lot of papers on this um, from the, the 2000s. Right. So anyway, so this notion of quasi-randomness is or is like yeah much more complicated. I'm going to try and explain it. Um, but the rough idea is that like in the graph setting. So I guess in this chart, I'm sort of thinking of. This row is for like binary things like graphs. This row is for ternary things like ternary hypergraphs. This is for four airy. And so in the in the graph setting, you know, the uh, regularity lemma has like a structure component, a quasi-randomness component, and an error component. In the graphs case, the structure is like the partition of the vertex set. Quasi-randomness is the regularity, and then you've got the like irregular pairs. When you move to the ternary setting, in this context, the structure, the structure component becomes much more complicated because you now have a partition of the underlying vertex set along with the compatible partition of the pairs. And then you have a, a more complicated notion of quasi-randomness that sort of deals with the, the way the ternary edges are distributed across the, the binary partition. So, so this is just a preview and now I'm going to actually attempt to try and explain a little bit about what this is. Uh, I've now like, uh, I've, I've given this talk several times and now there's three slides explaining hypergraph regularity. Um, so I think that as I've removed information, I think it's become more understandable, but we'll see. So, um, right. So I'm gonna focus on the case where K is three, cause that's uh, where this result lives anyway. And it's kind of easier to visualize. Um, so, so first we have to start with like, what is our notion of structure? What's the, what's the analog of the vertex partition in the graph setting? And so this is gonna be, uh, okay. And I should say the terminology I'm using comes from a paper of Frankel and Rodel. So, so I'm following that notation. Um, so we'll say a, a TL decomp decomposition for a vertex set consists of a, a partition of the underlying set Okay, so you have a, a vertex partition. And then for each pair in the partition, VI, VJ, you partition the set of pairs between VI, VJ. And so T is measuring how many, how many like vertex pieces you have, and the L is measuring how many um, pieces you have in between. So I, so I usually think of the, the partition in between is like, coloring the edges into L colors. So you have T vertex parts and you have in between each pair of parts, L different colors. Um, and the colors will denote by like, you know, P, if this is VIVJ, this is like PIJ1. 
Maybe the black one is PIJ2. Maybe there's only two in this case. So this is like the this is like the, the basic unit of decomposition. All right, and so what's going to replace the notion of regular pair in this context? It's going to be something called a regular triad. Um, so a triad is going to be, um, maybe I'll have one more color. Uh, it's going to be a three partite graph, and it's going to be obtained by taking um, three pieces from the vertex partition, so like a VI, VJ, VK. And then in between each piece, you pick a edge color. So maybe here I pick PIJ alpha. And here I pick, oh, this is also black, PIK gamma, no beta. And then, oh no, here's green. Here, this is like PJK gamma. So, so the, this is a three-partite graph. So a triad is just a three-partite graph obtained in this way. And now um, I wanna point out though that uh, the important part of this is that you can kind of partition the triples approximately in the graph um, as follows. So, so if I have a triad, so G is gonna denote this triad. So I try to use G for graphs and like H for hypergraphs. So if G is this triad, then triangle of G is the set of triangles in the graph. So it's the set of triples where, um, okay, I have a triple here and it's the set of triples where the sides are like the right color, the right colors. So it's the set of triangles that are like red, green, black, like this. So not, you know, not all the vertices are gonna be making triangles here. So, but on the other hand, if I pick, if I pick an arbitrary, so this, so like this, uh, this triple is in that, you know, delta of this G, if I pick a different triple, it might not be in delta of this G, but there is gonna be an edge color between each vertex. So there's a different, there's a different triad obtained by taking different colors that will contain the triple. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, right. So the point is that if you look at, if you look at like any, any, any triple, right, any triple from here, you can find some G who, so that it's a triangle from that triad. And the way you do it is you just pick this color, that, this color, this color, and that color. Okay. And by doing that, you can see that looking at like delta of G as G ranges over all the triads, you get a partition of the set of triples that are in different vertex parts. So that's sort of, I think that's like the, the most important picture to have in mind. So, so you've, got, you've got these triads, but the, the important thing to know is just that, you know, each triple is associated to a triad, the one where the edge colors come from, the edge colors used to make the triangle. Okay. Uh, so, uh, right, so a triad is gonna be our niche, is gonna, re a regular triad is gonna replace regular pair. Right. Now, uh, this is what it's gonna, okay, so this is where I kind of explain what it means to be a regular triad. Okay, so, so far I haven't mentioned a hypergraph. This was just like a notion of partitioning vertices and pairs of vertices of a vertex set. And now we're gonna introduce a hypergraph on the same vertex set and talk about what it means for the decomposition to be regular with respect to the hypergraph. So the hypergraph consists of triples of vertices and the, the P is partitioning the, the, the singletons and pairs. So I'll say that I'll say that P is epsilon. So there's two parameters to this. I'll say it's epsilon one, epsilon two regular with respect to the hypergraph. If epsilon one, almost all of the triples are in a delta G satisfying these properties, which I'll go through slowly in one second. And so the idea is that, um, okay, almost all the triples from here 
have the property that they're in different vertex parts. That's just standard counting. So almost all of the vertices are in delta G for some triad G, which, which triad, well, you know, I pick, I pick a vertex here and I just pick, you know, whatever, whatever this color is, I pick that PIJ alpha, I pick this P J K beta, and I pick that P I K gamma. So almost all the triples have a triad that they're in. That's kind of the important part from the last slide. And so this is saying that not only are they almost all in a triad, but something else important happens in their triad. So what does it mean? So first of all, we say that, so, so almost all of them are in like a, spec, like a triad with a special property with respect to H. What are the special properties? So first of all, as a graph, the edges of G are quasi -ran, like quasi-randomly distributed. And that's measured using the epsilon two parameter. And on the other hand, bullet two says that the edges of H are uniformly distributed relative to the triangles from G. And that by, by uniformly distributed, we measure that with an epsilon, the epsilon one. What does it mean to be uniformly distributed relative to the triangles? Well, it means like, like I said, if I look at this triad, not all the triples here are in a triangle from the triad, but it's saying that if I, if I look at what I look at only the triples that are are in a triangle of the triad, and then I ask, well, how many of those triples are also edges in H, also ternary edges, and then I and then I and then you insist that that's sort of robust by passing to like sub subgraphs basically of the triad. So so that so that's roughly what this means. I think I've I've attempted to give more details about what this means, and I don't think it's. Uh, Helpful, basically. It's a lot to it's like it's a lot to digest, but that's this is like the rough idea of what it means. And the and there's two parameters, the epsilon two measuring kind of how how quasi random the underlying G is, and then there's the epsilon one parameter measuring like how how quasi randomly is H distributed on the triangles. Yeah. So I'm just trying to understand point two. Does it mean that once you fix a triad G and you look on all, you have, you have some density of edges in H that are packed with this triad and say, this doesn't change much if you would yeah. restrict the IV dedicated with a small fraction? Yeah, or even if you pass to a small sub, like a subgraph. Is that right? Or maybe it's just if you restrict sub the vertices. Subgraphs, yeah. So I think it's even if you just take a, like a subgraph, you can delete the vertices. Okay, so this is uh this is so now that we know what that means, this is Frankel and okay, and I, I guess I should have I meant to preview to you that this epsilon two is usually in practice really really tiny compared to the epsilon one parameter. And so the regularity lemma of Frankel and Rodel says the following. Um, so basically, okay, so it says for any epsilon one, and now instead of like a fixed epsilon two, I'm gonna have a function, and we're gonna have we're gonna have that that epsilon one, epsilon two regularity where the epsilon two is gonna be tiny, not just compared to epsilon one, but like compared to the, the number of edge colors. Okay, so it says that for any epsilon one and function epsilon two, there are these bounds T zero, L zero, so that for any sufficiently large three graph, I can find like a little T and a little L. So the T's go with like the, like the number of vertex pieces and the L goes with the number of edge colors. I can find uh, a, part, a decomposition P whose T is bounded by this thing and whose L is bounded by that thing so that it's epsilon one, epsilon two of L regular. So, you know, epsilon two of L might be like one over L to the 100 or something. But it's important that it's allowed to become small relative to the number of edge colors. <coughs> All right, so this is right. So this is a statement by Franklin Rodel. Um, yes. Yeah, so so anyways, so that so this is the this is the particular like statement of the regularity lemma we'll focus on here. All right. So uh, the proof gives a Wowser type bound for both the T naught and the L naught. Um, right. And by Wowser, I mean like you compose the tower with itself. Excellent. 
All right, so a theorem of Moshkovitz and Shapira showed that the Wowser bounds are necessary for the T naught in general. So this means like, you know, so again, like just like with the normal regularity lemma, the applications again are like, what, what you can use this for is always gonna be sort of limited by like the form those bounds take. So you kind of want to understand what's the form of the bounds. The proof yields a Wowser. So this theorem shows that you can't avoid the Wowser for the T. All right, so uh, the, okay, so, and you may be wondering what's going on with the L, so we're going to return to that. <laughs> so, um, right, so the theorem I'm about to state is like a, an analog of, Okay, we're gonna get like some kind of nice bound under a certain tameness assumption. All right, but we don't wanna work with like normal VC dimension. We're gonna work with kind of a higher order version um, that happened to have been defined by Shellock. Uh, I don't remember the year, 2010 or something. So anyway, I'll tell you what it means in the three uniform case. So we'll say a hypergraph has a three uniform hypergraph has VC two dimension, at least L, if there are A1 through AL and B1 through BL, so that for every subset of now the Cartesian product L cross L, you can find a vertex C who connects to only those elements in the subset of the Cartesian product. So instead of like for normal VC dimension, you're shattering sets of singletons, now you're, well, you're still here shattering a set of singletons, but the set takes the form of a Cartesian product of sets. So you have, I have like A1, AL, B1, BL, and for any subset, any subset of the, I mean, this isn't a good picture. Let's draw it as like a square. So it's like, I have B1 through BL, A1, through AL. And now for any subset of the Cartesian product, I have somebody who connects to exactly that set and nobody else. So it's, a, it's, sort it's, yeah, so you're shattering kind of two dimensional sets instead of one dimensional sets. Okay, so, uh, all right. And so I guess uh, maybe this slide is at the end, but already Julia and I had shown that um, just as a, as a corollary of the counting lemma, if the hypergraph has bounded VC two dimension, you can obtain a regular decompositions where the triads have density like near zero or one, the regular triads. Um, so what I'm talking about today is, is, some, is like a, on top of that, I prove that you can improve one of the bounds. So the, so the, so the, 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 the T part of this theorem is for the L zero. Okay, so this says for any epsilon one, epsilon two parameters uh, in your theorem, you can, and any, okay, like the lower bound, for any K, you can find an upper bound L, and now the, okay, the statement of the theorem is like exactly the same as the Frankel and Rodel, except I'm assuming the VC two dimension is at most K, but, and I have this new addition that the, I can take the upper bound for the number of edge colors to be polynomial in epsilon one. Now, I think this should not be a K now. I think this is the dual again or something. I think I put a K and I meant to come back and check what that should be. Sorry, apologies. Um, right, so um, yes, yeah, so you can, you can indeed under this assumption um, obtain a polynomial bound in the L part, which I was surprised by. I thought this was a very strange statement. But this is what I think. So, um, let's see. Okay, so uh, I want to just say a couple words about the proof. Um, so the way it works is, like I said, we had Julia and I had already shown that if you have the bounded VC two dimension, you can get a regularity lemma where on all the on almost all the triads, the edge density is close to zero or close to one. And now you can move to a you there you can then move to a quotient structure which. It's, it's, a quote, it's a graph that's built out of the regular decomposition, um, and, but it doesn't quite have bounded VC dimension, but it has sort of locally bounded VC dimension. So the, the idea is sort of that you build the quotient um, 
and you build the quotient so that like one set of vertices are sort of going like this and the other parts are like the edge colors this part's not going to make sense but just to give you a really vague idea and then what happens is is that you get kind of a, a reduced graph so that when you localize to a single pair the reduced graph you have has bounded bc dimension so so it's it's only locally bounded it's like yeah so so there's a, there's a sense in which there's like if you zoom in on a single pair you have a quotient a quotient graph that you've built out of the regular decomposition that has bounded bc dimension yeah is there some dichotomy here after the graph theory? no no actually there's some there's some open questions i'd love for people to clean up for me actually so um so you have this local bound on the bc dimension and then on each of these local, these so you have like a whole bunch, a whole mess of graphs that have bounded BC dimension. And then you apply the Hausler packing lemma. And this method here is essentially the method used in the Fox Pox Souk paper. Um, and you get kind of a nice partition with respect to these bounded BC dimension graphs. And then you show that you can kind of amalgamate these partitions in such a way that you get a, a partition for the whole. Well, that's the really vague outline. Okay, so now I'll say so I'll say sort of some open questions and I don't know if I'll get to all the slides but um, because of okay so when we when Julia and I prove this theorem, the way you do it is you just apply the Frankel rodel regularity lemma and then you use the counting lemma to show that if the VC2 dimension is bounded the triads have to have density near zero. Okay, so in particular, this proof starts with that theorem and so thus I do nothing to the t0 and and so the t0 stays the same it's it's the same t0 as in the Frankel rodel theorem. yeah so that is the original proof what was bigger t0 or l0 I would have to like look carefully at that I don't know at the top of my head yeah. I, if I thought about it I can remember um okay so of course okay one question that that comes up immediately is under the assumption of bounded bc2 dimension can the t be improved can you get it like sub wowser and i've gone back and forth a lot on this i have i have colleagues with opinions um i still think the answer is no right now um the notion of bc dimension that kind of the answer is yes or maybe yes yeah, well, the one I showed you from the Fox Pox soup paper, for example, we can that that regular partition is stronger than this one. So under that assumption, you get polynomial on the T. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Right. Okay. And now we come to the most important um, open question. Which is, um, like I said, the the Shapiro and Moshkovitz paper doesn't explicitly say anything about the L bound. So, so it's possible that that they un, that that you know they understand that that this also needs to be a Wowser, but but I don't. So I would love for somebody to show that the L zero needs to be Wowser, like to give an example showing the L zero has to be a Wowser in general. Because right now my theorem, I guess, is not saying anything until someone does that. I think I think it's I think I think this should be true. This should certainly be true. I think um, I, I have a I have a model theory friend who who says that that he thinks this is obvious after spending time. <laughs> but there's nothing that there's nothing written down explicitly. So um, so that would be nice. Um, okay, and now I was gonna I'm gonna give a little preview to Julia's talk. I think um, really quickly. So now, now I guess you can. That's the that's the end of like the the main talk. So I'm gonna now. This is I guess like story time or something. So um, there's another way in which. Okay, so right. The general theme is sort of uh, about you have a hereditary property. What kind of structural dichotomies can you detect using kind of the regularity lemma as a measure of complexity? So we've kind of talked about bounds. Um, and you can also ask about irregular pairs. So given a graph, I'll say it has the K order property. 
if there are A1 through AK, B1 through BK, so that AI and EJ are an edge, if and only if I is less than or equal to J. So you're just encoding kind of a bipartite order. Or this is often called a half graph. If you draw the adjacency matrix, you color in like a bottom triangle. Okay, so we, and now this is terminology coming from model theory. I'll say that G is K stable if it does not have the K order property. This is a notion of tameness coming from model theory. And I'll say a hereditary graph property is stable if there's some K so that everything in the property is K stable. So you can think of this as like another notion of complexity associated to a hereditary graph property. Being stable is stronger than having bounded VC dimension. This is like a subclass of the, the bounded VC dimension case. Okay, so I'll say that the prop, a property is irregular free if basically you always have regular partitions with no irregular pairs. I don't know, someone can maybe help me. I don't know, this isn't a great, I, I made this up this morning. <laughs> I don't have a better word for this. Um, okay, so the natural question is, okay, is every graph property irregular free? Do you, can you just get rid of them all the time? So that was like the first question. And um, and now this is folklore, it's not in the literature, but I've seen it attributed to Lovas, Seymour, Trotter, and Alan Duke, Left, and Rodel Euster, um, which is that if you're not stable, then you're not irregular free. So if you have a large, if you have arbitrarily large half graphs, you have to have irregular pairs. And on the other hand, um, much later, Maliaris and Shelloff, using ideas from model theory, proved that if H is stable, so if you have a uniform bound on the height of a half graph, then you're irregular free. You have regular partitions with no regular pairs. So again, you get a dichotomy, which says that you're irregular free if and only if you're stable. And the in what sense is this a dichotomy? Well, there's also, um, you know, once you once you have a half graph, it's not like you just have one irregular pair. You kind of have a lot of them. So there is sort of a dichotomy there. But um, Right. So the preview is, I guess, this is like a little account of some other things that have been done around tame hypergraph regularity lemmas. Um, so I first, I guess I'll very quickly mention that Chernikov and Tausner have related results for the VC, the VCK dimension. Okay, their methods are infinitary. So, so it's, it's, it's not exactly clear if you can like deduce one from the other or vice versa. Okay, so they don't have explicit bounds. Uh, they, they obviously they don't have this polynomial bound or any bound, any explicit bound. So they use like ultra products. Um, okay, so with Julia, um, we like I said prove that this is a paper where we prove that just sort of um, the first VC two dimension uh, decomposition. Uh, but I also wanted ah yeah, so here's here's the advertisement. So we also show that. Higher, there's a notion of higher arity stability that characterizes special behavior of the irregular triads. So we proved like a hypergraph analog of the Maliaris Shellach result in the setting of this more complicated hypergraph right here. Um, and that work was largely inspired by or motivated by like companion work in the arithmetic setting around a tameness condition that gives you like really um, control over the error in quadratic decomposition. So I think that's what Julia is talking about tomorrow. So, um, right. And I think, okay, and now that's the end of the talk. So I'll stop. So, I mean, so this is the ability that we said is a special case of uh, this dimension. Now, another special case is of side length. It's more. Have you tried to see if there's any analog of that for hypergraphs? Does that make sense? Uh, so the dual, the dual side length is equal to the VC dimension. That's that. I thought it was bounded on either side. It's, it's, a, it's a different special case of uh, this dimension. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. But there is this paper about the dual side rank in VC dimension. <laughs> Um, uh, sorry. I think it's just silent. Really? Yeah. 
Is it? Oh, okay, well, they sorry. talk about dual sign. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, that's okay. true. You're, the dual sign is equivalent, maybe, to be something like this. Something like this, yeah. Yeah, but that's, yeah, that's different than just sign rank. Ah, uh, oh, okay. So maybe I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't remember what sign rank is. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess I don't know. Really yeah, that's how it's we invested a lot in the axial way because we look nice geometric structure, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I don't know what it means for hypergraphs. So the sign rank is a subclass of the. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really interesting. I don't know. I also, I mean, this is, there's a related question which I tried to solve with a grad student and failed, which is an analog of that um, connection to this between the sine rank and the VC dimension. With so you take the higher order VC two dimension. What notion of rank gives you an analogous result? You couldn't quite figure out what the right rank was because there was a lot of uh, enemies. So yeah, that's an interesting question. For that reason, it's not. I guess uh, it don't like there are these regularities stuff for semi algebraic properties. Are they also true for hypergraphs? Because yeah, yeah. So those so those are known for semi for semi algebraic hypergraphs. Those are known. Yeah. Okay. So bound the sound rank means also bound the semi algebraic. Like oh, the oh yes. Oh, so in that case, I guess it would be known. It, it looks like the the Fox Park super result, but the right where instead of density near zero one, you get like density exactly zero one. I think. Uh, I'm not prepared to give you like the correct attributions to those terms, obviously. <laughs> There's also, I guess, maybe a way for Julia to talk later, but there's also this um, stability for graphs is equivalent to this notion of little stone dimension. Yeah. And I wonder if the analog is true for hypergraphs. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, that's a whole, because the, the connection of little stone dimension and the implications of that, I think, are so new. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have no idea. I mean, I think the place to start with that would be to look at the VC2 dimension, because the understanding about VC dimension and like pack learning is, is like an older connection. And so I would think that first, this would be easier to understand what type of complexity notion is associated with this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Ok
<laughs> yes. So if you have if a if a hereditary property k from hypergraphs has unbounded VC k dimension, then the speed is like this for some c. And uh, if it has bounded VC k dimension, it's like this. Uh -huh. so where, where the epsilon depends on the dimension. Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much for asking. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first one is greater than or equal to, the next one is less than or equal to. Yes. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time on these, these counting problems. This is tight. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I mean, actually, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Uh, no, I mean, obviously, there are properties like, yes, that you can't do better than this. Like, there are properties that, like, actually oscillate between. They kind of oscillate infinitely often between these two ranges. So in, in general, you're not going to like improve this down or find any more kind of jumps in here. But I, this is a yeah, this is like the best other question I think for looking for these psychotic these like problems. Let's thank Darren again.